Hello and welcome to My Mom's Basement and another Penguin Recap edition of My Mom's Basement. And Agatha, all along, we had a finale. We'll get to that after the Penguin. It is myself, Robbie Fox, and Clem back again to talk about the best show on TV, a show that our boss, Dave Portnoy, texted me about and called possibly the show of the decade. That's right. Dave texted me this week. The Penguin is possibly the show of the decade. You agree, Clem? I never disagree with the boss man. I think that is a very bad idea at this company is to disagree with the boss man. Actively disagree with the boss man is actually the dumbest thing you could do. But just disagreeing with the general. So I'll fuck it. I'll sign up. Put it as the um like the the YouTube low either the headline or just the words penguin <laughs> yeah. show of the decade. Dave Portnoy. Boom. There it is. Couldn't confirm. I actually had a at some point before I watched the penultimate let's get fancy with our words here since we're a mm -hmm. big enough hbo show i was gonna say this is the best hbo show since and i'm thinking how far back are we gonna go and then like oh yeah succession was like a year or two ago it was so really quick house of the dragon i would put this above house of the dragon at this point for my own yes, personal interest in such a batman head but that was definitely really good as well until the end of season two when they did the whole friggin' Harren Hall thing. But we don't have to go down that path because we have a great show to talk about here in The Penguin. Another great episode. You mentioned the penultimate. We love penultimate episodes here in the basement. And it was a big like, are they going to be the Game of Thrones with it? Where this is going to be the big one and we're going to get the fallout next week? Not really, but kind of. Like, we need the fallout next week. But there's still enough players in place where it feels like the finale is where everything culminates. Yeah, this is – I'm trying to like – how to compare it to. It's like when you're playing like an arcade game and it's like you have a certain amount of like the grenades or the bombs or it's like the power-up, right? Star punches for Little Mac. They have – they use some this episode. They've used some for episode – like episode after episode. But they still have more. And you definitely knew there was – there's more in their pocket. And there's so many different ways it can go. But I still left – that episode being like damn like we are just at this rate you're just dealing with such a high floor but also knowing how high the ceiling is it's it's i'm just so happy we got a show like this man it's been a while and hey song of uh song of the decade show of the decade from portnoy <laughs> let's not forget a huge succession guy also his little sweet green baby yo He's a Mandalorian, yeah. and that's in the last decade as well. So, and I, I, you know, Mandalorian <clears throat> is a good show. It has really great characters that we love. I, I'm definitely putting this above Mandalorian. No, no disrespect to Mando and my sweet little uh, baby yo. I think this clears that for sure. It's definitely it feels more like, like prestige TV. They like using that mm -hmm. term prestige TV. This feels more like that than Mando, even if. Luke Skywalker showing up in The Mandalorian brought me more joy than anything this show can bring me. It's like it, it, you take and give. As a whole, this is definitely a, a much better, well-made show, well-written show. But Mando has the peaks. It has the the cheap stuff of like, ah, I don't love anything as much as I love Baby Yo, which my brother <laughs> did tell me. Trick-or-treating with the kids and stuff, he was like a lot less Baby Yo than years past. I said, just wait for that movie to come out and Baby Yo will be back like they made it or something. <laughs> like they like they breeded baby yo oh i mean i remember i remember when they they uh revealed baby yoda and like disney had like no stuff out because it was such a well-kept secret they had no toys they had no nothing really really ready for market yeah. this the movie was just as much about them being like we're going to do this the disney way now where I, it was like when <laughs> toy story came out and you get buzz lightyear that day on the way home from the theater with woody if you wanted to Yep. Baby yo, you won't be able to. It's gonna be like political commercials. You, you won't be able to turn on a TV without <laughs> yeah. baby yo getting shoved down in your face. So get ready for it, folks. Baby yo costumes are gonna be back. Shit, I might be baby yo for Halloween uh 2020, whenever that movie comes out. So very excited for that. Uh and I mean the penguin, honestly, the penguin. The way it all ends here, the penguin costume could have been big for Halloween if this had ended maybe a, a month earlier. Because I do feel like, like you said, it is spreading around not just like Portnoy loves it, our whole office loves it. Friends, yeah. family members I talk to who just like got into it who aren't even Batman people are like, no, I heard it was good and holy shit, like I'm hooked. Good TV, prestige TV. God, it feels like it's this is two sides of me here. This is the basement side of me who's like, thank God we get to cover a show that's this good and fun to review. But then it's also like the I just love great TV, man. That's you know, when I first started writing at Barstool, that's why I love writing thrones. I'll write succession stuff, I'll write kind of any if I get hooked to a TV show, I'm obsessed with it. 
this is kind of right there in the mix too. So it just feels so goddamn good to have one of these back in our lives, even had nothing to do with the comic book nerdy side of my brain. Let's start breaking it down. I'm eager to talk about it. It's every Sunday night. I want to text you after the episode or after you watch it, but I'm also like, I want to save it for the podcast. I have Mm -hmm. that. Like I want to talk about it right away because it's that good. We start episode seven, the penultimate episode, Top Hat, with a flashback to Oz's childhood. And right off the bat, I got to shout out the kid they got to play Oz. He's doing the accent perfectly. He's not cringy as a child actor. The kid, he's even breaking down the episode in the little post thing they do, like the HBO breaking the episode down at the writers and showrunners. The kid is like, I think Oz made the decisions he made in that moment. To, I'm like, I'm watching like a 10-year-old kid explain the plot of a TV show to me right now. They show Oz and his brothers, the dynamic between them. Clearly, he's jealous of them in a way where it's like the mom gives the thing to Jack, right? And she's like, no, 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 Jack's got to handle this. And you could see Oz's face almost be like, why don't don't you trust me with that mom? Total mama's boy. And they go and collect some money from Rex Calabrese, who we've heard so much about throughout this show. We don't know a ton about him other than he was the main mobster. He was the one running Gotham back then. And it seems like he almost had Francis cooking his books for him. You get that vibe. She's like, you got to give Rex's book back to him. But it was kind of like it looked like an accounting notebook or something. I get the vibe. He's co- she's cooking the books for him and he's paying her off a little bit on the side. Yeah. Francis is a full time, at the very least part time employee of Rex. She had, that's she's yeah. a numbers girl, does handles, handles her business for him. And again, you said it with the kids. I immediately got the same kind of vibes where it was like you could sense it's like this is like. I love my mom. You guys are just kind of like, this This is my, you know, he's a mama's boy. He's definitely a mama's boy. And it sense how much he kind of like loathes his brothers. I see with my kids where, you know, they're fighting over, especially mom, but occasionally even dad gets in the mix too, usually because like they want to play video games with me. But there is that sibling rivalry, but it's like, hey, usually that stops to a point. You just don't have a sociopath as one of the siblings in this. I thought AJ might have been a little Oz. As he's grown up, I've realized he doesn't really have that bone in him. But man, you could just see in his face. It's like, and I'm sure Oz has some serious shit. He has obviously the leg. He just seems like more of a shut-in than the other two. And clearly uh, the oldest is the favorite. That's that, that's her dude right there, you know? And he's it's jealous of him sure. too. The kid doing the limp is spot on with Colin Farrell. Like the way he actually waddles. I'm like, holy shit. And he's got the brace on his leg. And that's clearly when they're walking. He's always walking a little bit behind him. They have to go deliver the book to Rex. And he says to Rex, like, hey, Rex, nice seeing you. His brother tells him to watch his mouth. Are we getting the vibe that Rex might be his dad? That maybe Rex knocked up Francis? And he's also yeah. – out with the money because those are his kids and maybe even oz knows that and that's why he said to rex like nice seeing like almost like hey nice seeing your kids right and his son is like hey shut up yeah it it, it there there's something up there and i they said i don't think they alluded to the dad being gone but that or it's like you know was he ever there i don't really know also shout out to to mama cobb she puts it together. She has, you know, she has seen her with her fastball back in there. I'm like, all right, lady. I Good actress, too. Another one where yes. I was like, oh, I could totally see her as the young Francis. That worked. Mm-hmm. And we made a big stink about this with Acolyte and, let's be honest, a bunch of the Star Wars franchises. And now to see this on the other end of the spectrum with the Penguin – the kid actors, they nailed it. Like yeah. there are such th- things as good kid actors. So if we criticize where some of these shows, it's like that, that kid actor, like I don't want to be mean, but it just, it, it kind of ruins the scene. Not always the, the kid's fault the either, you know, I'm sure it's yeah. the directing, it's the editing. I'm sure it's the writing. It's like, you got to write for a kid. You can't write adult dialogue for a kid and expect them to deliver it well. You got to work with the actors, I'm sure, make it sound like it's in their voice, but everything came together for it in this, where you get to the scene where they go out down into the sewers and they're playing and you're like, oh, this is, you know, why he chose the sewers, I guess. And then it's like, oh, this is why he chose the sewers? Because a Clem prediction that he said on the podcast two weeks ago came very true in devastating fashion. They go down to the sewers. It's raining. You could tell it's a real stormy Gotham night. And when they go down the ladder, Oz takes it as an insult, almost as if like you're making fun of my disability because I can't go down the ladder. He starts going down. He gets nervous. He goes back up, shuts the sewer door on him and goes home without any remorse, leaves him to die, realizing like where his brothers are. He lies to his mom, says they're at the movies and then just has that smile as he's watching the 
program on television with the top hats and the it, they're all wearing like the penguin suit basically and like, <laughs> yeah. that's where he got his sense of fashion from but a haunting haunting 10 minute intro that really like again they they took you to a flashback so you, you almost feel like oh but get on with the main story where we left on a cliffhanger but it's so good that you don't think that you're just like holy fuck he did kill his brothers and it's like the way he snuggles up with his mom, the way he looks out that window where you just keep hearing about the rain, you see how much rain has gathered. And it's like, if you're a kid, now granted, I don't, I didn't live near drain pipes or whatever the fuck, sewers or whatever, but I don't know if it, it resonated in his mind. Hey, my brothers could be drowning right now. Or if, if he's just like, good, fuck them. Cause I'm thinking like, oh, they're just going to get out the other way and come home being like, fuck you Oz. Why'd you do it to us? Maybe he thought there was another way. And maybe he's just like, I don't care uh it's it's chilling and again this dude might just be one of those people that has no feelings towards other humans and doesn't feel bad that he killed his brothers and you know maybe wanted to or is like hey whatever happens to him happens i don't know but again the way he had said initially you know with that innocuous the city took him was kind of like there was something up with oz i susless number one and susless like confirmed big green check mark next to that one like just an awful terrible human being kills his brothers and how it all you know obviously impacts his mom down the road but it's like at the same point like his mom has this the odds in her too my big strong bull and fuck them uh i'll be tap dancing on your grave like i i love Sophia says to her later on not to skip ahead but she's like Hey, he didn't have a dad around. He had to be raised by somebody, right? Like she was the fire that he was fucking forged in. And she's still the one pushing it of like, you better become a kingpin for me. You better do this. You better do what it takes. It's her. Like she's kind of the puppet master behind the strings. If uh, if he Oz is fucking uh, Jason Voorhees, she's the mom doing all the creepy <laughs> shit in the shed. Yes, great call. It doesn't just have to be horror movies where the mom, you know, makes the kid the man he is today. It could be gangster stuff too. And I think Tony's mom in Sopranos is a much different version of that. Tony's in the life already because of his dad. But the mom definitely fucked with his brain enough in a whole other oh, yeah. slew of ways. Um, two other things I wanted just to note. One, you said this about the Penguin. I don't think you said it on the pod though. But what did you say out of the Star Wars universe that a show from the Star Wars universe could have been the Penguin if it had been done correctly. Oh, you remember? my God. The, the Reddit thread, there was a like a Reddit thing that said, this is what the Book of Boba Fett should have been. And it hurt me to read that because I was like, ah, fuck, I keep trying to defend the Book of Boba Fett with the, it's cool when he rode the Rancor. What about when he dropped the seismic charge in the Sarlacc pit? But reading that, I was just like, oh, fuck. This is what the book of Boba Fett could have been. This show, <laughs> rising the kingpin, doing fucked up shit, making him a little bit likable, but also a little bit like, I don't even know if I could trust this guy. There are so many things this show did right that the book of Boba Fett did wrong. Even the flashback sequences were interesting. Like, this is the show that should have been. So, yeah, that pissed me off. And think about it. Like, the way Boba Fett was raised by his dad, bounty hunter dad and the, all the stuff with the clones and there's some weird shit you could have really dug up there and and then even rex and the way he's looked at is what boba fett i think kind of they could have made it where it's like you're the yeah. looked at as the cool gangster of the town and instead they made him this like like neither it the made him not monarch. cool or bad it made him an arc yeah it was the book of yeah. boba arc yeah it was it was crazy and then the other thing i had a shout out was they had two references for the 80s kids out there one was he, the mom's like where did what movie did they go to he's like i don't know beetlejuice and she's looking in the paper bob god's honest truth i'd say you could look at my google search results i don't want anyone to look at my google search results even my guy here <laughs> my brother my basement brother but i looked up the other day movie newspaper movie times because i just wanted to see what it looked like because i remember it vividly and just the feeling you would get when you're looking like oh man like i can get out of the house and i can be there at 6 20 and i just love the way it looked and shouting out beetlejuice obviously you know very fun movie and then she's they're talking about we can play double dragon for you know days if we had that 50 dollars. man double dragon is a good fuck great arcade game tell me bob fox did you ever play double dragon growing up oh 
man, no, that kills me. I, I have no memories of playing Double Dragon. I do have memories of looking in the newspaper for movie times, though. Like when I was really little, when I'd get dropped off at my Aunt Laura's or something, my Uncle Brian would be like, hey, pick a movie. We'll go to the movies or something. I would pull out the newspaper and look at it. We were just talking about that in the office the other day because like one of New Jersey's main newspapers, the Star Ledger, is like closing. I was like, ah, oh, damn, I have good memories of like reading movie times and that. Speaking of the Beetlejuice connection and just the Batman connection, my brother texted me this picture yesterday. Really weird, but Voodoo is trying to capitalize on the current Beetlejuice hype by changing the Tim Burton Batman posters to look Beetlejuicy. <laughs> wow. Isn't that weird? All right. That is very weird, but I kind of like, hey, do you like, like Beetlejuice? Maybe you'll like this Tim Burton shit. And they're right. You know, if you do like, if you like one Tim Burton thing, you'll probably like another. Yeah. I think all Beetlejuice fans are probably fans of the Tim Burton Batmans, but not all Tim Burton Batman fans are fans of Beetlejuice, if that makes sense. Probably right about that. You yeah. know, but I, I like the fact that you have people in there who are kind of just itching their creative brains and kind of rem remixing stuff up. It's yeah. like they're, uh, there's this guy, his name is Matt Ferguson. He does the, um, yeah. Guardian, he does a lot of posters and he did Guardians of the Galaxy one, two, and three. And it's New Hope, Empire, and Return of the Jedi, where he does those po those iconic posters, but remixes them with all the Guardians characters. It is fucking mwah. check that guy out, man. He's he's a fucking that guy's an awesome artist. follow. I've been following yeah. him for years. Amazing poster artist. Um, back to the penguin. Oz gets home in real time. This is the current modern day story. Vic is knocked out and Francis is gone. We saw at the end of the last episode, Sophia was in there with the crowbar and Oz decides I got to take this head on. They got my mom, so I'm staying here for it, but shoves Vic out the window through the fire escape. Sal comes in, starts kicking the shit out of him with a golf club. Just having that like, yeah, now I got you where I want you. And it's, it ain't so great for you, Oz. I don't have any uh, security guards holding me back. I don't have any shackles on me. Sophia and Francis, meanwhile, have an intense conversation, an intense face-off. Uh, she tells him, like, my son is going to kill you. She's got confidence. She's not nervous at all until she's reminded of her boys. And then she snaps into an episode, and she starts getting worried. Where are they? They should have been home by now. And Sophia, just like you suspected, does have a little sympathy for her. This could be Sophia's de demise or downfall that she does have a little sympathy. She showed it here. She showed it later on with Gia in the episode. So she kind of feels it and then kind of snaps out of it when she gets smacked in the face by Francis. <laughs> She's like, fuck away from me or whatever. Really good scene, though. Another one where it's like the acting on this show is just next level. This cast had they had the chemistry. They locked in place and it all fit. Mama Cobb, I have one word for her. Spunk. Tell me that woman is the <laughs> fucking definition spunk. of spunk. Holy shit. And like Oz, we've talked about it in um in this series, even in the uh the Batman where I saw his like El Rata quote was like yeah. going back on Twitter, and just the way he acts, like even the backup, you got plenty of room where he you know he'll say that after he like wants to rip your nose off with pliers, and it is just I mean, she is the perfect matriarch for an absolute psychopath like this. And I also have to say, like, just the things like you're going to get an ass tattoo. Like, that's such a I, and I, I, I don't want to I don't want to seem like the hard on Northeasterner. But like that's you, you would hear something like that from like a fucking New Yorker on the side of the street. Like it's a New York, New Jersey, Northeastern kind of thing. And this woman just crushed that fucking role or the writing crushed it a little bit of both. I also wouldn't mind if Sophia wants to get that ass tattoo. I'd watch. I'd look, I'd look, that's all I'm going to say. Take care of the ass tattoo. Yeah, that line. What are you going to do to disappoint your daddy next? And to piss him <laughs> off. Well, it was so good. Pretty pink hair. <laughs> Then Sal brings Oz back to his own operation underground and he tells them all like, hey, if, if you need a quick adjustment period, make it be now because I'm taking over. So, you know, I'll be the one signing your checks now. This is mine. And Penguin gives one of his guys the signal, cuts the power. They get into a big scuffle, a big fight, power struggle. Penguin and Maroney are in the bus. They're fighting. Maroney's got the upper hand. And all of a sudden, just like Batman in the Dark Knight Returns, he gets cardiac arrest. He goes into a heart attack, starts wheezing, falls backwards. And at first, Penguin is almost like, no, not like this. Like, I don't want to win like this. He just falls backwards and Penguin goes, no, 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 no. And he's like, fuck, fuck, what the fuck? 
And the way he stands up and says, he's like, the fuck? Cracked me up. His voice cracks as he's saying it. And then he snaps into this, like, as he's saying, no, 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 no. And you're like, is he upset about this? He just stands over Maroney. He's like, I got you. I fucking win. I won. I got you, Sal. Stands over him again. And then that camera angle they chose sideways. Yes. You see Maroney. And then he just starts firing bullets into his body. And the camera's shaking with every bullet. What a fucking scene. Every week, they're giving you at least one oh fuck moment. I didn't think. I wrote the blog last week on the most likely characters to die. I had him towards the bottom of the list in main characters because I'm thinking they're bringing in a new commissioner or a district attorney and the new um, the Batman 2. It's got to be Harvey. Maybe they want to go with the comic accurate Maroney with the acid in the face at the court trial. But no, Salvatore Maroney, rest in peace. R.I.P. Well, I don't know about it. I shouldn't say in peace. I shouldn't say in peace. Rest in hell, rest in piss. Rest in piss is always a good one. I don't like when people say that about their enemies. Uh, I think we said Maroney's biggest weakness for making it to the Batman 2 was his like age and the fact all the Falcons are gone. So they might just say, Hey, reset. We're not going to worry about what your traditional Batman, you know, gangster universe looks like. We're going young blood here. And yeah. Dying of a heart attack, you know, as an old man, I think that kind of just checks out as like a good way to kind of like say, "Hey, it's over." And I, I guys, I, this is my, this is like, this might speak a little bit about my kind of like sick and twisted mind. I talk about like Lucky Number Eleven and how I love revenge porn, kind of fucking not revenge porn, but like revenge <laughs> movies is could be like porn if you want to just see someone suffer that you like, you know, kind of wronged you. I was thinking, like, I love how the penguin was like, look at me. I did this to you. Yeah. Kind of like, I won, not you. This is like, I'm going to be the last thing you see. Yes. And then he was like, and fuck this. I'm getting my bullets in this guy that I wanted to get. He was probably dreaming of for years, let alone as he was getting his ass kicked with a fucking one wood. And I just love that he fucking unloaded in him. Unload the clip. With the ring on, too. Yeah, it's hard to like look like a badass in front of your like henchmen too. If you're like, oh yeah, the guy had a heart attack, he croaked, he <laughs> yeah. was gonna probably kick my ass, and I was gonna die. You have to just make it seem like uh, you won the fight the old fashioned way. And yeah, throws the ring on. I'm like, oh, we're bringing the ring all the way back now. Mwah! I'm gonna give another mwah, chef's kiss to. I mean, another old fuck scene. We just keep him rolling here. And Clancy Brown, shout out Clancy yeah. Clancy Brown, great performance as Salvatore Maroni. Really gave him like a. A different vibe. Usually you get Sally's like the hey, hey, hey. And Clancy was more fucking, you gotta be afraid of me because I'm a large human being who can fold you into a box if I want to. <laughs> or, you know, if he's have has a heart attack, he can't. But it makes sense he's to go in that box. box. Right after his, his son and his wife burn up in the fashion they did, he escapes prison after getting stabbed. Like guy was stressed. He had a stressful week for sure. And Sophia goes to visit Gia, the little girl who was, I don't know if I would say she was threatening to talk to the cops, but Julian had heard that she was going to talk to the cops about something she saw that night. Winds up being that she saw the gas mask in Sophia's backpack. Sophia just sits her down and is like, listen, your mommy and daddy and our whole family, they were very bad people and you should be happy that they're dead. I'm very happy that they're dead. And has that harsh talk with her in there. But when she leaves, clearly feels sympathy for her. She breaks down in tears against the wall of like, oh, my God, what did I do to this little fucking girl? Then gets the call from Oz where it's like she, she it's from Sal's phone. So she answers. She's like, what's up, Sal? He's like, Sal's dead. How does that sound? And he makes this deal with her where he's like, listen, I know you want to kill me, but you want the operation more than anything. You want power more than anything. I will give you everything. If you give me my mom unharmed, not a hair on, you know, untouched on her head, whatever. She's, she knows it's a trap. She tells Julian, but she's like, whatever, we're making the deal. It's a trap from her end as well. Cause she sends in a car. They do this whole scene. The car comes in. You can't see anyone in the car. So you got to be thinking right away. This could be a trap. It's a trap. It's gotta a trap. Be thinking that. It is a trap. She calls them and they hit you with a little silence of the lambs. Like you think they're in the same location, but they're in different locations. She's in daylight and there's a car bomb in there. Car bomb goes off. Not only destroys, I would say, their operation in the sewers, but we see the overhead angle, like almost a helicopter style angle. It destroys a big portion of Gotham, a big intersection, gone. 
And they use this to show another flashback of the night Penguin took his mother out dancing, the story he told Sophia earlier in the season, and how she was kind of like, you got to make something of yourself. You got to support me now. And then they take you back to him being taken out. Some guy, you know, above the wreckage, the rubble. It's like, oh, it's the Penguin. He's like, what the fuck did you call me? It's like, Sophia wants to see you. Boom. Boom. Another cliffhanger to end the episode. And another moment where you got to ask, where the fuck's Batman? So, first of all, I think we, we talked about this earlier. We didn't realize the spelling, this and that. We can officially brand her Sophia with an F. Because that was a F fucking move right there. Badass as fuck is what it was. Um, the entire plan you're hoping, you're like, all right, is she like still a little softy? No, 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 no. She has learned her lessons from this show. And... And Penguin in peak Penguin form isn't like, hey, boys, run. He just fucking scurries himself out after they fucking were ready to tool up. They got their guns. I got, you know, I, I, I it may not be a huge army, but it's all I need. I love you guys. And then see ya. I'm just going to jump into the place where I deserted my literal brothers, you know, years ago. Fucking Penguin, man. What a Penguin is a rat. I don't care what they fucking said in the Batman. The yeah. Penguin is a fucking rat himself, right? <laughs> I forgot that he went into the actual sewer door where his brothers died to shield himself. That was like George Lucas says, it's like poetry. It rhymes. Mwah. Yeah. And I believe the word, the, the phrase I used, which might've been incorrect, but I said the pregnant pause when he looked at Gotham water company, and I thought it's cause he was going to, you know, he knew he had access to Gotham, Gotham water supply. Clear, clear that, that was way wrong. That was just a sewer thing. It's clearly because, you know, that's his brother's final resting place, for lack of a better term. Um, but it, it also, like, that completely blew up what we thought the Batman 2 was going to be. We're thinking, oh, he's going to have yeah. Bliss on the underground, completely running it, just like, you know, the Penguin in Batman Returns. He has, you know, he's going to be the, the criminal underlord of literally the underground, and Batman is going to be looking for an enemy who's not even above ground for the most part. Nope, turns out that is all completely gone, which is another thing I love about this show. They keep us fucking moving. They never let us get too set in our yeah. ways and sit and be like, this is the status quo. Everything is changing every single episode. I feel like if we watch episode, if we do a full rewatch, from one to the finale we're gonna be like holy shit like this is this changed even more than we were realized because every week we thought we were getting settled in and they just keep us on our feet the entire time i appreciate that i'm also gonna go to bat i can't believe i'm the one on the podcast right now doing this i'm gonna go to bat for our, our i'm gonna go to bat for our batman for lack of a better term <laughs> i think there's been some crazy shit that's happened but it's been kind of contained in the mob world where I don't think Batman can really like worry about every like little shootout that kills two or three criminals. True. This is a massive one though. This is a big this one. one. Yeah. I mean, like, the, the ground is caved in. Caved in. And like, there's probably not a lot that's going to get him. Like you said, he was concussed, he took a shotgun point blank range at the end of the Batman seawall collapsing. God knows the casualties and human just catastrophe that's going on in Gotham right now. I think when the street implodes and then when you see what scene was underground, it's going to be like, all right, gotta, the man with the cow has to come take care of business here. So I will say there's been a lot of where's Batman. I don't, I think those were unfounded, unfair requests until now. Man better be showing up. Doesn't have to be in the episode, but by the end of the episode, it has to go on his to-do list. Like top three, top three of the to-do list is like yeah. figure out why was it Crown Point? Is that yeah, Crown Point? Crown yeah. Point. Why the street collapsed with an explosion in Crown Point, leaving a bunch of people dead and a drug operation there. I think he has to put it in the top three on his to-do list at that point. I mean, at the very least, Commissioner Gordon is running around the gcpd looking for the bat phone just being like where the fuck is he we need help half the cops here are corrupt anyway gordon's getting no help he's got to make the call to the bullpen get the bat in here some people have suggested could the final shot of the entire series be the gotham you know you show penguin rising to power and then you pan up to the gotham night sky and the fucking bat signal hits that would be pretty badass that'd be a way to do it where Batman doesn't like overtake or overshadow the show, but it just reminds you, hey, we're calling in Bat next. This is the next guy to deal with this threat. That would and be pretty badass. I, think. I, I agree. And it would also say, hey, the Penguin has now made it to the point in power 
where Batman needs to be called because traditional methods cannot stop the man. And that would be like uh, maybe the final, like the, you know, you, welcome to the NFL moment. That's just like, welcome to the yeah. Gotham throne of the criminal underworld moment. It's like, we now have to use the bat signal to deal with you. So people another- pointed out on Reddit as well, when he thinks he got away from Batman in the chase in the movie, I think he says, I got him. I got him. I got her. I got you. I got you. He's so confident. And that might be like a catchphrase of sorts for the penguin now. Cause he mm. says it to Sal when he thinks he, or, you know, he did kind of kill him, but he's taking the credit for it. He might be an, I got you guy. Just always, I got you. And then he gets got. I, I, kind of I would like that. Idea. I would like that a lot. Um, you, 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 you sent me a couple through text of one of them, including our guy, heavy spoilers. And then there was someone else. Couple of people got sneak peeks of the f- finale, and they're like, but "Heavy spoilers!" Called it brilliant. Anytime a British person uses the word "brilliant," it means so- a little more. <laughs> it means yeah. a little more. Yeah, it's a little more from them than it does from us. <laughs> um, I'm excited though. Yeah, except there was a little sliver of me being like, "Shit!" I've recommended everyone this show now. Dave's calling it show of the decade. I've got everyone in the office watching it. They better stick the landing because if they don't. It's going to be one of those, you know, House of the Dragon last season. People look at the whole season differently because of the way the finale was. So I was worried. Now my worries are set aside. Like, I I don't think we got anything to worry about next week. Yeah. Yeah. The B word went a long way with me. And I I think we're I think we're, we're good for now. Speaking of things that are brilliant, let's tell the people about Game Time, an absolutely brilliant sponsor for my mom's basement and all of Barstool. It's the official ticketing partner of Barstool Sports. We love getting out to live events, whether it's a concert, a football game, a comedy show, whatever it is, we're using Game Time. You know how much we love Game Time already, but with their new Game Time Picks feature, they're making it even easier to get out to a game. This past weekend was the Basement Bowl. Commanders yeah. versus Giants. We've even got the colors on. The Commanders came out on top. I will say, to give the Giants a little win, I loved the throwback jerseys. The Giants mm. on the helmet instead of NY I think is so much better. Um, so the Giants won the jersey battle. I don't love when the commanders do the the maroon pants and the white. I always loved the white with the gold pants, but that's a story for a different time. Game time picks. This is the best feature on any ticketing app. It filters out the fluff, shows you only the incredible deals on great seats. So you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. If you're looking at game time right now, we've got UFC Saturday, November 16th at the Garden, which is always the craziest. You you could barely get in the building for under $1,000 in the Garden. Game time gets you in the building for $326. Jones versus Stipe. It's going to be a hell of a fight. I'll be there. If you go there with game time, you'll see me there. Pull up your chosen event. Turn on the GT Picks option. It's very, very easy. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app. Create an account and use code MMB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code MMB for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. What time is it? Game Time. We love Game Time. We love them. And I'm sorry to bring up, you know, Commanders Giants. But it's not been the greatest season for the Giants. I'm sure it's not like you're you're devastated. It's not the worst season ever for the Giants. It's just at this point I am um, indifferent. Like you want to take? Bank or no? I, I, it's like I don't even care anymore. It doesn't matter what I want. Doesn't yeah. matter. I wanted them to tank last year against the Patriots. They won. We would have had Jaden Daniels in New York if they had lost that game. You know, it's like could have had Drake May. We didn't. And uh, I, when I, as I saw the commander, it. as I saw the commanders had too, I was like, fuck. I was like, you got the commanders, and I'm like, and I'm wearing a big blue sweatshirt right now. <laughs> the, this is the worst part, and we'll get. This is just a very quick into the sports corner of the base. Yeah. This is the worst part about the Giants now that. Hurts me. And the thing is, the Giants have given me four championships in my lifetime, three that I remember, two that were at the time I thought the greatest sports memory I'd ever get. And one of them, which will probably be the Patriots 18 and 0, is going to be nothing, almost nothing will be able to top that. So I'm fine with like the Giants. And it's like, if they're going to just piss me off, I'm just indifferent, whatever. I've covered them for 10 years at Barstool and it's been almost just nothing but crap. But this is the problem, Bob. And you don't have to experience this yet. And I hope you never do in, in one sense. AJ wakes up on Sunday morning. It's like, Dad, Giants today. Giants today. Oh, oh man, God, Giants oh. are going to win today. And when it's like a game like yesterday where it's like a three-point spread and it's like whatever, like maybe they can win, that's cool. But when he does this and it's like a 10-point spread or it's just a game I know they're going to get washed and I'm just like, this poor kid has no idea what's coming. And if I tell him, no, dude, listen, 
Giants might not win today. He's like, no, the Giants are going to – like he has that belief in him. <laughs> and it's been beat out of me even as the positive Giants fan or I try to be one of the positive fans here at Barstool. And he just has it in him. And I, I don't even know – like I, I just see the look in his eyes. And the thing is – God knows how many Washington fans grew up and had that look. And then yeah. I, I, I said the PFT at the, at the pump punk show, I am legitimately happy. You guys have Jaden Daniels. I consider commanders fans and Knicks fans kind of like brothers in arms. where We had these tyrannical yeah. owners who would just ruin everything for us. No matter what yours is gone. Ours has somehow been like shooed to the side. And I am like legitimately happy just because you guys are in it with us. And I don't have hatred in my heart towards watching like I do with the Cowboys and Eagles. That like, hey man, Jaden Daniels is fucking awesome, and I just love watching He's that. Awesome! Guy. It's fun to watch Washington football. I, I I've only been able to see that one other time in my life for like a couple months in 2012. It it is fun. Like I'm wearing Victory Monday hats. I'm getting excited and, about wins. It's, it's I've crazy. never experienced this. It's the dream right there, dude. And we've all had different athletes in our life who are young and fun and and great. And again. Like Daniel Snyder with the way he treated the field is part of the reason RG3, that entire experiment just went to crap. So it's like, if he's gone, you figure they're going to take care of this kid the right way. And he's just fucking, again, Quinn, I was kind of, Quinn. we're quitting. Yeah. You're quitting. You're quitting. You have, and like, it's one of those weird things with football. You just understand. It's like, it's like the players they have, it's not like everyone just, they just got all these great players. It's like, but even the defense is getting better. And it's just when I think a team believes in someone, they can just, and you start, you start winning, and then you have like a fucking miracle hail mary. That's when the magical yeah, that shit was happens. Awesome. That the, was this, this Mets season made no sense. It's like we had all these guys who were not great. We had a couple great, you know, very good players, and it's like, but when it starts rolling, man, it's stuff that makes sports fun. So, but when it goes the other way, as the Giants fans can attribute, it's just like at this point, it's like I don't even. They are on the small TV muted, and on the big TV, I don't have like the red zone on the big TV or like the game of the week. I have the multi view of four other games on the big TV, yeah. and the Giants get like you know the odds cob. If I if I had kids, the odds <laughs> cob TV, just the little shit TV, the little jerk of the family. <laughs> um, before we get into Agatha all along episodes eight and nine, last week I said there was only going to be eight. I didn't realize two part finale yeah. this week. Before we get into it, we got to tell everyone about Hello Fresh as well. The holiday season is just around the corner, and we're always looking for ways to spend and stress less. Uh, HelloFresh makes mealtime nearly hassle-free with delicious, home-delivered, chef-crafted recipes that come together quick and are less expensive than takeout, way less expensive than takeout. Um, whether you're craving hearty comfort food, trying to please picky eaters, or looking for a calorie-smart meal plan, HelloFresh has all of those options and more available on a rotating menu of 50 recipes every week. Step out of your recipe rut, make some fun, flavorful meals without needing to hunt for specialty ingredients, and their pre-portioned ingredients make uh, food way less wasteful. Like, you're not wasting, you know, an entire whatever salt shaker full of stuff that you need for one specific recipe then it's going to sit in your cabinet for months hello fresh makes it easy it's good for a date night you're cooking with your wife your fiance whoever your significant other get 10 free meals at hellofresh.com slash free fox again that's the what they would say if i was incarcerated they would say free fox they would have the signs you're <laughs> going to go to hellofresh.com slash free fox it's applied across 10 or across seven boxes 10 free meals New subscribers only, varies by plan, but that is 10 free HelloFresh meals. Just go to HelloFresh.com slash free fox. We love it. It's the best. Now, like we always say, especially this time of year, fall into winter, everyone, you're not out as much. You're kind of just staying in, hunker up, you cook by yourself, cook with your, your partner, your spouse, kids, whatever it may be. Just a nice little way to like just get through the day and, and eat some like good food because at the end of the day, you just feel good eating that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Now let's get into Agatha All Along, episodes eight and nine, the finale. I'll count, you know, both of these as the finale since they came out together, two part finale. And I'm ready to say after the last couple of weeks of saying pretty good episode, pretty good episode, pretty good episode, they land at the plane. Pretty good finale to the point where I would say pretty good show. Like Agatha All Along, I did not think would be a show for me in the beginning. It wasn't really a show for me. But it was still enjoyable enough where I wasn't mad that I watched this show. I was kind of looking forward to it by the end. When episode eight ended this week, I was like, oh, my God, we have to watch episode nine. It was actually interesting. Episode eight ended in such a way that felt like a finale, the penultimate. 
that I thought I picked the wrong episode. Like I said to my fiance, like, did we watch episode nine? How are they going to do an episode after this? So it was a, it was a cool, almost Thrones-esque in this way. Episode eight was the big one. Episode nine was kind of the epilogue. Okay. So yeah, very Thronesy in that, in that way, which is fine. We heard good things going into it and I'm happy they delivered. Uh, I, I have to also say to the people that watched Agatha, um, I think there's a little bit of revisionist history that this show was known as going to be a hit or it was a hit from day one and everyone should be hopping on board. I, I, based on my reviews with Rob and what I was reading online throughout the weeks, like let's let's call it what it was. It got hot at the end. It didn't. It, it was wasn't Jim half, Daniels yeah. week one. Yes, it was a second. No, half. I liked the first episode, but I was I I don't want to say I was in the minority, but even people here at Barstow was talking to Gia and Kelly. I think they didn't love the first episode and then loved it as it progressed. I liked the first episode a lot. Didn't really like the next maybe two or maybe three. And then by the time you started doing the Billy backstory, we learned a little bit more about why Billy exists and he looks a little bit different now. Everything from that point on, I thought was pretty fucking good, pretty gripping. And I was like, all right, I'm down for this. Aubrey Plaza was great. Uh, Catherine Hahn was great. Billy, by the end, I didn't love him in the beginning. I thought he was pretty good by the end. Uh, Joe, Joe Locke, I think his name is maybe. I could be wrong about that. Let's get into it. Episode eight begins by showing Alice, the hot topic, which who died a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. We show her meeting death when she died. So she like sees Rio, Aubrey Plaza, and she's got some like prosthetics on her face. She looks a little skull-esque, but she's lit dark in the shadows. You can't really tell at first. And Alice is just like, oh, no, no. Like, I just broke the curse. This can't be it. This is it. This is all the time I get. And that's a big theme is all the time you get, all the time death gives you. So they show death taking her away, and then they cut back to the witch's road. And death realizes that Billy's soul entering this boy that died happened. And she's like, he cheated death and accuses Agatha of hiding this from her. She's like, I see the way you look at that boy. And Agatha's like, I don't care about that boy. You're wrong about me. I'll make sure that that boy sacrifices himself to you to correct the course of all of this. As long as I never have to see your face again. I don't even want to see your face when I die. You know, and she says like hundreds of years from now or whatever. So they make this deal. All right. If you bring me the boy, you don't have to see my face. They continue along the witch's road without Rio, without death. And realize at this point, it's just Agatha, Billy, and uh, Jennifer Kale, one of the other witches, just three of them left. They see their shoes from the beginning. So they're like, fuck, we just walked in a circle and nothing happened. And you're starting to think, is this a Wizard of Oz situation? Is the witch's road real? Is there something you get at the end? Or is it just a fucking wizard behind the curtain? Um, Billy then winds up and with Agatha and Jennifer in like a futuristic version of Agatha's basement. It's very strange, but they're only, it almost looks like they're on, on um, like in a morgue. Do you call that a morgue when it's like bodies in a thing and you pull them out? It's like bodies in shelves. Yeah. When they have the, uh, the, the, the bodies are covered, you have to identify them. I always, I always wondered if they're is in, that in the morgue. I think it's in the morgue. Yeah. So I will say that. Yeah. So it, it looks like that a little futuristic. They're in it. Eventually, <laughs> they get to the point where Billy is like trying to reincarnate his brother. He's trying to conjure up the energy to put his brother's soul into a boy and is going through the morality of like, he sees a boy drowning in his head. And he's like, am I killing this boy to put my brother's soul into him? Or am I just putting my brother's soul into a boy who's dying? And it's an interesting, like, Oh fuck. Is he making the decision to kill someone right now to get his brother back? And he, he sees it, whatever. You never, I don't think we ever, ever got like a clear answer on whether or not he did kill a boy to do this. And eventually he reveals his full costume, the Wiccan costume. I don't know if you saw pictures of it online. It looks very comic accurate. He's got the red kind of cape robe, the blue jumpsuit. He's got the red. Um, and in the moment, for the first time ever, at the end of episode eight, he's able to talk to Agatha through telepathy, which he's been closed off from the whole time. So he kind of like pleads to her, I think, I think I'm remembering all this right. Um, and she makes a sacrifice for him. 
So when she's like, hey, death, look, I brought you Billy and he's ready to sacrifice himself. She is a change of heart last minute. And she grabs Aubrey Plaza and just starts making out with her. But when you kiss death, all the energy from yourself is sucked away and she kind of floats up. Agatha, dead, dead oh. in episode eight. And then Billy like gets in a, his car, a Subaru, which I think is a joke because they say Subaru is like a gay car, gets in his car, drives off. And uh, I, and Jennifer Kale also got away. She's like one of the witches that got away. Jennifer Kale, also the cousin of Ghost Rider. So if they want to bring Ghost Rider huh. in at some point, you connected it that way. She gets off, flies away. And it felt like that's the end of the series. Like Agatha's dead. She sacrificed herself to death. What can you do from here? The, the finale took it in a, in a different direction, but also, oh, I'm forgetting this big cliffhanger at the end. He goes in a Subaru, he goes home, goes back to his room, and then he starts looking around. And he sees a Wizard of Oz poster, and he sees a poster for the Witch's Road, and he sees a poster for this. And you start thinking, wait a minute, everything you saw on the Witch's Road was something you're into and have posters of in your room? Clem, big twist. He created the Witch's Road. The Witch's Road is not real. The entire time, Agatha knew it. He created it just like Wanda created WandaVision. It was Wiccan's memory all along? It was Wiccan all it along? Is Wiccan that all along. So that wow. was, like, it feels like the episode ends before that moment. And then he's in his room looking around and you're like, oh, fuck. But then at the very end of that episode, he hears what sounds like Agatha's voice, like in his head. And that's what happens in Wizard of Oz, too, where you have this whole thing and then she wakes up and it's you were there, you were there. And all right, I'm a little confused. Now, this is the thing. I also didn't like look. I, I, I thought I had heard about Wiccan, even Lady Death after you told me she was in the show. I was like, I'm not going to look at what these people look like because I might get spoilers. Now that it's over, I looked at Lady Death. That's kind of weird. I don't know how it looked on the screen, but the it couple pictures. OK, I looked it good. that's good. Wiccan. Wicked looks all right. People, it sounds like people were go, losing their mind. They loved it. I don't, I didn't know Wicked as a comic book reader. Yeah, I thought he, I thought really he looked good, but I wasn't losing my mind over him. Yeah. 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 I, I'm also like, again, loved Wanda, liked Vision, loved the whole dynamic in Infinity War and Endgame. I guess just Infinity War. I love that. Obviously, WandaVision. I'm kind of like, I don't need, like, I'm not dying for these new characters yeah. to enter the universe. Looks fine enough, though, as someone who doesn't uh, doesn't follow all that. The whole Wizard of Oz twist, though. I like that. Okay. Okay. So we're doing also kiss, dying via kiss of death. Pretty badass. Shout out to Agatha. Pretty metal. metal. Pretty, Pretty metal. fucking metal. Pretty fucking metal. Then yeah. you get the finale where they explain Agatha's true backstory with her son. There was a moment where I think it was Rio, Aubrey Plaza death, who said to her, like, and why do you let them say those things about you and your son? Almost as if like, wait a minute, is that story about her giving up her baby for the dark hold not true? Is that the legend of Agatha Harkness? It is the legend of Agatha Harkness, and it is not true. We open the finale, and I think it's 1750, Agatha running through the woods, pregnant, clearly about to give birth, and her child is like about to die in childbirth. As soon as she's giving birth, death walks out from behind a tree. And is like, I'm ready to take him. And she's like, please, please, no, give me more time. At this point, I think uh, they were already a thing, Agatha and Death. They were already acquainted. So she begs her for more time. And she says, time is the only thing I can give you. That's it. More time. So they show us through the years, Agatha raising her kid, Nikki. And Nikki starts singing as they're running through the forest one day. Down, down, down the road, down the windy road which is exactly as the witch's road went. It was down, down, down the road, down the witch's road. Agatha takes this song, has him go perform it at bars and stuff, and then finds witches, brings them into the woods, and says, we have to sing this song to start a spell. She would sing the song with the witches and then start scolding them, being like, you guys are horrible at this. You guys ruined it, to the point where they would use their powers on her. She would suck all their powers out and continue to live her life through the hundreds of years. So the Witch's Road song, which was such a continuous thing through Agatha all along, was it all, it was a trap that Agatha set that was her son's song that she would use to kill witches and whatnot. 
Um, and she's revealed to have done this through hundreds of years, and she doesn't want to die and, and doesn't want death to take her. And that's why she made the agreement with death in the last episode. I don't even want to see you when I die because she can't face her son knowing that she killed so many people like in his name almost. Mm. Her son died just of a cough, like you know, a sickness, not a cough, but started coughing, then got sick years later and just died because death could only give them time. She couldn't make it so the son wasn't going to die. Yeah. But she gave Agatha a couple more years. And then they cut back to Billy's room at the end of the last episode. Agatha is there as a force ghost. So she didn't see death. So she didn't like cross over that oh. plane to death. She's there as a ghost and she's got gray hair, which Agatha in the comics is an old woman. So she actually looks a little more comic accurate and she comes back for her brooch, which is another thing Agatha is always wearing in the comics. And she's able to grab it. So even as a ghost, she's able to like touch stuff and affect things. And they go through this whole thing where it gets a little sentimental. And Billy tells her, uh, you know, your child would forgive you even if he knew what you did. And he goes back down to the basement where they created the witch's road. And he draws like the satanic fucking circle, thinks about banishing her, but doesn't banish her. And then the series ends with them searching for Tommy. They're like, all right, let's go find Tommy together. Billy and Force Ghost Agatha. I don't know if they'll do another season of this. I think it was pretty successful in terms of streaming numbers. I could be wrong, but I did see like a decent amount of chatter on it on Twitter. And I feel like that's a good indicator of things generally. I was surprised the series ended with them searching for Tommy because I thought that's what the whole series was about. <laughs> so that was my only thing where I'm like, I'm okay with it, but it feels like we were all the whole time being like, eventually you're going to get to this Tommy search, right? And they got to it at the end. So I don't know if they'll do a season two. I mentioned it feels weird that we're going to take these characters and put them in the MCU, even though they're already in the MCU. Just feels so disconnected and so different than what we've seen. But again, overall, a, a good show. I would say my personal taste, I would give it like a B minus. It was overall a lot more enjoyable than like a secret invasion. Uh, I would put it on the same level as a Miss Marvel. I would say two shows. I wasn't the target audience for that I found decently enjoyable. And, and they didn't hit the mark every week. They had a few episodes where I was so-so on it. But as a whole, good stuff. We'll take that, right? We'll take yeah. that just as Marvel fans, as someone, as people that want to see the universe expand. Again, not for us, but at, like I think when when sh when – what is it franchises hit a certain peak it's good that you're expanding and you're getting stuff for the little kids and you keep aging yeah. up aging up and then for the fucking people in the basement who are gonna say worst thing ever you gotta get stuff <laughs> for them too so i have to have everyone happy so um <clears throat> bob i gotta be honest i thought you did a tremendous job explaining this if i rewatch the entire if I rewatch the entire thing, it might come out completely different i don't know but i think this was a fair way to go about it we gave it the um the love I think it deserved. It got something, but like, let's be like, as someone who hasn't seen one of them, like, I think it's heavyweight versus lightweight with this and Penguin. All right. Oh, Penguin is not even close. It's like, with all due respect to Agatha all along, it's like hard to even call that a television show when you watch yes. the Penguin. It's like, oh, that was the cute Disney Plus thing. And we'll watch the real show on Sunday nights. <laughs> all due respect. No disrespect. No disrespect. All, all, all. All due respect. Don't want to be, <laughs> you got to be careful what you say. And it's also the other thing. Like, I think a lot more people are watching Penguin than are watching. There's plenty of people I know yeah. who are like, yeah, I'm just going to, like, I, the MCU has reached a point now in terms of at least the amount of stuff they were churning out along with the quality they were churning out, where you now have me who's like, I'm going to sit this one out. And it's, yeah. Robbie explains it to me. I do a YouTube catch up. Hey, maybe I do a binge if it's real. If it's really good, I'll hop in. I have no problem hopping in. But like, you just don't have my hour a week every single week locked in because of something you did five, ten years ago. It just it can't be yeah. like that anymore. Unfortunately, that's also I, the difference between Agatha and Penguin. Like I wouldn't recommend Agatha to everyone. Like uh -huh. if you, I would say like you're so into the MCU and you loved WandaVision, I'd be like, oh, it's worth the watch. But I wouldn't be like, oh my god, you got to go to Disney Plus and watch Agatha all along. Like I would never say that to anyone. Where the like, penguin, I am going up to everyone I can find. And if you're breathing, I'm recommending you the penguin. If someone, say, picked you up to go somewhere and it was a Subaru, you're like, hey, I got the perfect show for you. <laughs> yeah. Something like yeah. that, maybe. <laughs> um, and I, 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 here, by the way. Oh, go ahead. 
No, I think it's fair. And I, I told you this. I, I don't know if I said it on the pod. I had alluded to it at least a year ago, but I, I finally pulled the trigger. I think in, in about 12 days or so, my Disney Plus subscription is up and I just hit like, do not renew. I know I'll probably end up paying more if I do a monthly or I, you know, renew for whatever the year is. I'm sure I could also probably find like one of those deals where you get ESPN Plus and 17 other things for less a month. But uh, they don't just, I am not automatically just locked in to Disney. This is what my Disney Plus uh, is. It's whatever we review for the pod, which granted, there's going to be some Star Wars stuff coming out, some Marvel stuff. I was going to say, we got to watch like a month till Skeleton Crew or something, do we? Yeah, <laughs> I think. We're gonna, and that trailer looked very good, right? It, it looked looked like Goonies, like you said. We're going to have um, Andor Season 2. There's going to be some good Marvel stuff. But as of now, my viewing is like, if we watch a Marvel show, if we watch a Star Wars show, and then it's like, I'll occasionally rewatch Infinity War or Endgame, and my kids watch Bluey. That's it. That's the history right there. I can't, and actually the John Williams, uh, I got halfway through that documentary, which was awesome. Um, I just, I'm it, I'm making a stand against the mouse at this point. They're fucking expensive for the parts. They're expensive for streaming. The quality is not matching the standard that I hold them to. So I will be there, and I will probably pay more than I have to to do the monthly or whatever it may be. And it's kind of the same way with their shows. Now, Max, on the other hand, their next project, I'm going to have to be a little more in for DC stuff because they're on a winning streak right now with the Penguin, right? So I think that's yeah. kind of how I view the two universes. I do think both are going to get good. I think we're going to have a Monday Night Wars kind of thing with the two franchises. And I think it's going to be better for us and everyone because of it. But as of now, like Marvel, you were just... You're just not where you should be. <laughs> I you did. I was gonna say the John Williams documentary you mentioned. M big high recommend on Disney Plus. I watched it yesterday. I loved it. It was like I was tearing up. Just, I mean, the fact that the entire documentary is scored by like the greatest hits of John Williams. <laughs> it just makes it ten times better. It puts it on that upper level immediately. That we saw the trailer for Skeleton Crew, a new trailer for Skeleton Crew that I thought looked really good. Like again, it's kid actors, so. We're going to go in a little trepidatious, but it's John Watts. It's the team behind the Mandalorian. It looks already the quality level of the Mandalorian. It looks a lot more Mandalorian than it does the Acolyte mm -hmm. to the level I'm like, I don't mean to keep harping on that show, but just visually it looked cheaper than most of, than all of the Star Wars shows we've seen. Why? I don't know. Cause they spent more money on that one than any of the other ones. Maybe you're just building practical sets. It wasn't shot right. I don't know. Skeleton crew looks like we're back on that level. And we saw the like short mini trailers for a bunch of Marvel stuff. They did like the Deadpool short, like teaser wonder man, this, that, the next thing. I think I'm hoping I'm praying we're over that hump of the old stuff was being pushed out and cranked out and just get it out, get it out, get it out. Now we're back in the, we were talking about it this morning with Captain America, Brave New World. They're doing more reshoots. And you said, hey, maybe they're just reshooting the whole thing and making a good movie this time. I said, maybe it's Kevin Feige taking the camera out of the director's hand and being like, no, no, I'm doing it now. Maybe he's <laughs> fixing everything. He's literally taking the toys out of those people's hands and giving them back to the Russos and being like, that's their toys, not <laughs> yours. You know, like fingers crossed that we're over that hump. And this is the, this is the good time. The Monday night wars, as you suggested for the Mar Marvel and DC nerd universe. You've always felt like there could be a post end game hangover, right? I think everyone kind of feared that after end game mm -hmm. was, you know, did such a good job wrapping everything up. And then there was also like the COVID malaise where it's like 2021, 20, 22, where it's like, COVID it's weird, strike. It's it was a lot of challenges. Yes. Yeah. And like, I think everyone was kind of just resting on their laurels. Like you see this all the time, you know, like it, they had grown to a certain size where it's like, Hey, we're just going to give this person a camera. This person gets a shot to direct something. And it's like, no, let's make good fucking shit. So I think, and like you said, I hope like they're building the airplane out of the black box. Maybe that's how they're going to do Captain <laughs> America. If that's what it takes to make a good movie, I'll fucking take it. Cause I want a good movie, not a bad movie. Also, just wanted to say thanks for coming to Pup Punk. Clem made the drive to Pup Punk this weekend. We had our Halloween show. Clem and the missus came dressed up. It was a hit of a costume. And we had a lot of good costumes, actually. Got a lot of good, like, 80s, 90s movies costumes. The winner was Fat Bastard. It was an unbelievable, like, the Fat Bastard prosthetic. Lord David Snyder and his wife Courtney came as Macho and Miss Elizabeth. Tremendous costumes. They gave me a Slim Jim on stage. I ate on <laughs> yep. stage. I actually talked 
for this show. I usually don't talk into the mic at pop punk shows. The crowd demanded it. I, I talked twice. I said the first time I said, good evening. Crowd went wild. Second time I said, I'm eating a Slim Jim. Crowd went wild. So it was a good night for me. We were the Ghostbusters. I teased that last week. I said, we're not like a, it's not a basement costume, but it's a basement adjacent costume, I would say. And we, we had to, we all had to cut up our Ghostbusters. We had to cut the sleeves off, cut the knees off. They were the biggest Ghostbusters costumes ever. PFT <laughs> was wearing one before the show. He had to wear a, a, like a, a separate one because the first one he started cutting off, he, he cut the knees off to make it like shorts. But then you couldn't tell that they were two legs. It just looked like a Ghostbusters dress. It looked <laughs> so bad. It'll be in the Pup Punk vlog, I'm sure. Make sure you subscribe to like the Pup Punk channels and stuff. But it was a great night for us. I hope it was a great night for you as well. You got to meet my brother for the first time too. Yep. Uh, me and Mike Fox met. We embraced. And by embrace, I mean hugged the hell out of each other for a while and just <laughs> had a BS talking about talking about our boy Bob and how he's growing up right in front of our eyes. We talked about all the um, – all the, we talked, we're talking nerdy stuff. We're talking Batman, Penguin, how much we're loving it. We're talking – parental stuff as a couple of olds here it was a, it was just a lovely night um i went <clears throat> i went to my friends jamie and annie who are big stoolies as well and just like and they they were like oh my god when can we come back like they just had a blast i think anyone who's ever been to a pop-punk show you just know the kind of just electricity you're getting it's watching a real band play but it's also like the greatest cover band we've ever seen and the energy is just electric <laughs> and the costume contest which made it like a whole other level of of just awesomeness everyone dancing just shaking their ass having a good time um and yeah and it was for the people, was for the people cool. so they can see your costume too finkel shout out ace ventura Yep, I was Finkel. My wife was on horn. We uh, we rocked that as the costume, and uh, I just wanted to shout out one person that really made a difference, and it was two a.m. Clem who drove home from New Haven, got home at two a.m., and drank six glasses of water before he went to bed. And it's the six. only thing, it's the only reason I'm still alive right now, Bob. Oh I my god, six, I and I woke drowned. up. <laughs> I was like, I was his brothers all oh, too soon, too yeah. soon. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> I I drank six glasses of water. I was like, dude, how thirsty are you? But like, I had a couple. Let's be honest, a couple pieces of Halloween candy that I had to wash down. But I was like, I think that was my sixth glass. And you know what? I woke up in the morning. I had to pee. I peed once. That's how you know my body was like, dude. I mean, I said, I don't know how you guys were jamming on stage the way you guys were because I was gas after the regular set the encore i was gassed after the second song you guys had three more in you and by the end of the we night we do a long encore yeah, yeah billy joel level encore oh it was nuts and then 2 a.m we tell the people we come out and we're like, you want one more you want <laughs> one more we take five <laughs> can't say enough great things about pump punk if you're anywhere near oxford mississippi which yeah, is this friday this, this friday. friday wow we're playing we're playing all miss the library at all miss which is allegedly like an amazing venue we're excited for it and then if you're not going to be in town for that one towards the end of the month we're going to be at fred's lsu which is going to be mm. before big game i think the college football show might be there that weekend i don't know yet i think it was like touch and go but it might be a big barstool weekend at lsu and i've heard amazing things about fred's but they are at mississippi they're definitely going to be at us i don't know i think so I it, but it was i have no yeah. idea Oh, it was announced. Yeah, yeah. Good. So, so it is a Barstool weekend this weekend for sure. And Brandon Walker hates Mississippi, so you're gonna have Brandon Walker. Yeah. You're gonna have you know I'm sure I'm sure Big Cat. I'm sure like everyone's gonna be out there supporting the boys. So check it out if they're in town. I can't promise anything. Has this been discussed though? I need to know this. There's gonna be one person there that is an X factor. And at some <laughs> oh, point, he's gonna Vince? end up on that stage. Uh, <laughs> they can put Ben Vince in front of a live mic. He will not only end up on the stage, I'm sure he'll end up like on top of the crowd at one point, probably face down crowd surfing in the, the you know, amazing manner he does it. He crowd surfed at the Pup Punk Chicago show, so I wouldn't put it past him. Yeah, if Mintz is there, he'll probably, you'll probably see him on stage at one point. And he's going to probably have his King of the South shirt on where he's like 18 years old, looking like a baby yeah. with that suit. I'm going to call this now. And this is going to seem like it's not a hot take. And it's, I don't know if it's a hot take, but it's just... I'm just just throwing a prediction out there now. On Friday night, this weekend, I'm going to say this weekend. This is my take. This weekend, Ben Mintz is going to have an all-time Ben Mintz moment. But it's not going to be for what he wanted to do. 
It's going to be the old yeah. The funniest part is not how he planned it. It's all the other stuff. It's the guy just getting doused with styrofoam as he's opening the bobblehead. It's his shirt being shown as he meets Sean Payton instead of the interaction with Sean Payton. It is, we are going to have a tier one Ben Mintz moment. And I think it could be happening at Pub Punk. And it's like, does he jump off the stage lot. and he just lands on his face? Does oh, he- like Jack like- Black in the beginning of School of Rock. <laughs> yes, I, yeah. I'm telling I you mean, right now. I, just- I don't want to root for that. I love Ben Mintz. But there is an opportunity to see a potential all-time Ben Mintz moment live. And it's free, too. That's the other thing about these oh shows. Oh, my God. Come to the bar. You don't even need a ticket for it. We're playing the bar. It's going to be a big night. Like, come on out. The library this Friday. If I fucking hadn't just used up my, you know, this was my wife who was like, we got to go to Pop Punk. If I could get there, I would. I've heard the Grove is an awesome place to tailgate and, you know, you can watch the game there. But it's like a tornado trying to figure out, like, there's probably ways you can figure out where the tornado is going to, like, gather. But you don't really know until it happens and how big it's going to get. That's a Ben Mintz moment. And I'm telling you, I'm, like, reading the fucking little circle ball things, like, the way the winds blow. And I'm like, oh, there's one gathering. In Oxford, Mississippi, yeah. this yeah. this week. Yeah, we're 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 in the calm uh, before the storm right now, right in the eye. <laughs> All right, go to Pup Punk Rocks uh, R A W X for more info on that and the LSU show and all of that. Make sure you like this video if you haven't already. Subscribe because next week we will be breaking down the finale of the Penguin. It's bittersweet, but I'm excited because once we're done with the Penguin, it means the Batman Two hype revs up. So same bat time, same bat channel. My mom's basement.